Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you are here this morning. I think after that, I just want to lead us in a prayer and ask God to bless us and cause us to believe that something impossible could happen. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for this day and the beauty of your creation that surrounds us. We are thankful that we can be here in this moment and hear this story, this impossible story, because it gives us the hope that the impossible can happen again in our lives. And so we bring right now to you all of the impossibilities in our lives, the impossible relationships, the impossible health concerns, the impossible financial anxieties, all of the things that we feel cannot be solved or redeemed or salvaged or saved. We bring them to the God who does the impossible. And we ask you to do it again. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's take a moment. Can we just stand and greet somebody nearby? Give them a hug and a handshake and just tell them, I'm glad you're here. Let them know they're...
seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Let's take our offering. And these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sorrow, Thank <laughs> you. 
mindful this morning that nothing is impossible. And in a few moments, Jody will share about some of the greatest impossibilities ever known to the world. And as we consider that, we consider the impossibility that you would send your son to die for us on a cross. And yet we are grateful because of our sinfulness and our great need for forgiveness that only his blood could atone for. He is Emmanuel, and we offer our thanks as we remember that in his body and in his blood as we take this communion together at this time. And it's our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated as we're served.
God, again, we offer our thanks. We're thankful because you are with us. And we come today to bow at the manger and to bow at the cross. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son, for his love. Thank you for the beauty of sending him as a baby. Thank you for the signs and wonders that he performed. May this now be our testimony as your followers that Christ came for us and now we go to others for you. Bless us as we remember this in the taking of this cup. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
There's a ladybug on the table. If it was at my house, I would have just killed it. But I figure here it wouldn't be a good look. So it was going to bug me, okay? What are we doing? Well, I don't want it. Why are you giving it to me? Hang on. Give it to one of the elders. And one of our... You do a really good job leading worship and getting rid of bugs. Thank you. So the sermon has been debugged. That's good. Um, one of our sons called the other day, exasperated. This is back before the holiday. Uh, he called, exasperated out of his mind because his three-year-old, who was strapped into the back seat in their minivan as they drove down the expressway, was peppering him with questions. The kid's really in the trucks right now. I mean, the, the big transfer trucks. And so the questions were, Dad, where's that truck going? What's in that truck? 
Where'd that truck come from? How big is that truck? How much can that truck carry? How much does that truck cost? What's that truck driver's name? Can we get a truck like that? Just went over and over. And my son called and he says, Dad, from the moment he wakes up in the morning to the moment he crashes at night, I feel like I'm sitting across the table from a police investigator and I'm asked one question after another until I'm going to crack. And then Tyler says, my son says, why does he do that? I said, so let me get this straight. My son is calling to ask me a question about why his son asked so many questions, right? He said, yeah, and I said, well, that right there is what we call ironic, okay. <laughs> Do you ever notice that about kids, though? I mean, they, it's like they only speak in the interrogative mood, right? Everything's a question. Uh, uh, there's a British study, they actually studied this. They studied like 1,000 kids, and they determined that the average child between three and four years old will ask 73 questions a day. It's exhausting, right? And here are the top four questions that, that, that they found that children asked. Number one, why do people die? Number two, where did I come from? Number three, what is God like? Ooh. And number four, what does we can't afford that mean? Okay. <laughs> which is the answer parents give to children when they say, can we have a truck like that? No, we can't afford that. That's what that means. I can actually help you with this, moms and dads. Um, and this is a, a suggestion. People who, ha who haven't had children will say, here, I know how to do that. People who have had children will go, here's a suggestion, okay? So here's a suggestion. Because it is exhausting when your children ask questions. So try this. And it's okay to say this. I have no idea. I have no idea. It's better if you follow that with, I have no idea, what do you think, okay? Even better when you say, I have no idea, let's find out together. And then you go, okay, Google, and then <laughs> you can go find out together. There's a guy named Peter Block who uh, wrote a book called Community, and about a third of the book is about questions, so I think the kids are on to something. Here's what, here's what Block says. He says that questions are more transformative than answers. He says that questions that have the power to make a difference are ones that engage people in an intimate way, confront them with their freedom, and invite them to co-create a future possibility. Powerful questions, he writes. I love this part. Listen to this. Powerful questions are the ones that cause you to become an actor as soon as you answer them. You no longer have the luxury of being a spectator. Which maybe is why Jesus asks so many questions. And he did. In fact, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus asked 307 different questions of people. And he was asked questions 183 times. So apparently Jesus thought questions were really important. I want to ask you a question this morning. I don't want you to answer it out loud. And we're going to do something a little different. We're just going to sit here for about 30 seconds and be completely quiet. Just plan silence. I just want you to look at the question and engage it in your mind and think about it for just a half second. You ready? Here we go. Here's the question. Who is or who was Jesus Christ? Who is or who was Jesus Christ? Just think about that. See, even before you get to the end of the question, you got a choice to make. Is it who is or who was? The verbs is and was 
speak to the subject's current state of being. Is Jesus an is or is Jesus a was? Now we know that there was a Jewish prophet named Jesus who did in fact live in Palestine in the first century and was crucified by the Romans. We know that a religion that spans the globe did evolve from claims made by and or about him. Those are facts of history. If you believe the story that after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb and three days later rose from the dead to live forever, then you have to ask, who is Jesus Christ? And when you frame the question that way, it invites a deeper, more personal reflection, one that does not permit you to remain a spectator. You have to ask, who is Jesus Christ to me? If you, if you don't believe the story or you don't feel you have enough information to decide that the story is true, then you have to go with who was Jesus Christ. And just so you know, there's no judgment there. I'm not judging that choice. I'm just acknowledging the fact that the story is, for many people, difficult to believe. We have the freedom to choose was instead of is. So that may be where you are. But even then, you're confronted with the knowledge that an obscure Jewish prophet born in a backwater of Roman-occupied Judea over 20 centuries ago was arguably the single most influential person in history. How did that happen? And why? Now here... And in thousands of other faith communities, we, we talk about Jesus all the time. We talk about Jesus every day. This time of year, though, kind of feels like everybody, whether they believe Jesus is, is, or was, seems like everybody is talking about him. So the question, who is or who was Jesus Christ, is as vital and as relevant a question as any we could ask. It's also a really very old question. In fact, the, one of the earliest attempts to provide a comprehensive answer to the question, who is or who was Jesus, was made in the late first century by a disciple named Matthew. And he's the, his is the first of the four Gospels. When you read Matthew, one of the words he uses over and over is the word prophecy. He uses it about over 40 times in some form or another, prophet, prophecy, prophesy over and over again. It's more than any other book in the New Testament. And it shows up in the very beginning of Matthew's story about how Jesus was born in Matthew chapter 1. And I've asked a friend of mine to come and read that for us. Hannah, can you come up and read Matthew for us? This is Hannah Segrist. Say something so I can be sure your mic is on. Hi, I'm Hannah. Hi. Are you nervous? No. no? Okay. I'll go stand over here. Okay. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Thank you. Good job. Yay. So did you see the part in verse 22 about the prophet? All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. When we hear that word, prophet, we think future. I mean... 
That's what prophets do, right? They, they predict what's going to happen. But Matthew's not thinking about the future. In fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 1, he spends the first 17 verses looking back into the past, into Jesus' genealogy. He's thinking about the past. He, he's looking back on what was said, not forward to what will happen. In that sense, a prophecy is more than just a prediction. A prophecy is a promise. It's a promise that something important is going to happen, and a fulfilled prophecy, a prophecy that comes true, is a promise kept. This is a little dry, okay? But this is really important. So hang in there with me. In the Bible, prophecy is rooted in God's relentless faithfulness, God's utter reliability, God's complete truthfulness, his inability to lie, his, his unwavering trust, worthiness. When God tells a prophet to predict something, God is making a promise. And if that prophecy fails to come to fruition, it's not just because God didn't take into consideration all the mitigating circumstances. It's not because things changed. It's because God didn't keep his promise. And so when Matthew talks about what the prophets promised, what he's really saying is that the faithfulness and the trustworthiness and the, and the reliability of God are all at stake. And right in the beginning of the story, the very first thing he does is spotlights two promises that when we hear them, we think impossible. Those are impossible promises. The first one is hard enough to believe. The second one, it's so hard to believe you have to take it on faith. So let's start with the easy one. And the easy one is the virgin will conceive and give birth. Now, a lot of people find that hard to believe because biology, right? We took science. Some of you teach science. Many of you make your living in science. And so I totally get it. If somebody in the room is in that group of sincere, sincere skeptics who see this and go, yeah, no, that's not how any of this works. But if, you're gonna, if you struggle with the virgin birth, the virgin birth is just one of hundreds of things in the Bible you're going to struggle with. In Genesis, it talks about how God created everything out of nothing. It's called ex nihilo creation, creation out of nothing. You're going to have a problem with that. You're going to have a problem with the parting of the Red Sea in Exodus. Seas don't part. The walls of Jericho that we sang about it a minute ago in Joshua, you're going to struggle with that. The floating axe head in Kings, come on. Jesus walking on the water or calming the seas with the word or restoring sight to the blind or hearing to the deaf or mobility to people who couldn't walk or the big one, rising from the dead. A lot of people think the Bible and science are mortal enemies. They're not. Science, in fact, has done wonders to open our minds to the beauty and the glory and the mystery of God's creation. But science and the Bible do part company on at least one subject, miracles. Science stakes its value on the assertion that there is an objective, verifiable, repeatable, natural, keyword, natural explanation for every phenomenon in the universe. Now, science is humble enough to say, you know what? We got it wrong here. So let us correct that with this new information. Science is also humble enough to say, we don't know every explanation, but it believes there is one. 
that there is a natural explanation for every phenomenon. The Bible agrees with science that there are explanations for everything with one caveat. It asserts that there is a God who is so powerful that he can cause things to happen in defiance of the very natural laws he put in place. He can supernaturally cause things to happen. We know those things as miracles. The virgin birth would be one of those. And then when you look at the other stuff in the Bible, the other inexplicable things that God did, the virgin birth is not even the most spectacular. In Genesis, he formed a human being out of dirt and breathed into it the breath of life. And if you've seen pictures from the Hubble telescope, I mean, come on. That's incredible. Thank you, science. And thank you, God. Here's another question. You can just kind of rummage this one around in your head a little bit too. Would, when we, uh, when staff has a birthday, so what is it, one of our staff members has a birthday party, we have a little party, and we always have the birthday boy or girl play Would You Rather, and it gets awkward sometimes. Can you imagine? Okay. So I want to ask you a Would You Rather question. Would you rather live in a universe where everything can be objectively, precisely, naturally explained right down to the mathematical equation, the chemical analysis, and the quantum property? Or would you want to live in a universe where 98, 99% of the things can be explained, but you're surprised by the occasional miracle? I'm kind of going with the occasional miracle universe. The virgin birth is not the most impossible thing God has ever done. And it's not even the most impossible promise Matthew says God kept. That comes up in the last part of the sentence in verse 22. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him, here it is, Emmanuel, God with us. In other words, God came here in the skin of a baby human, grew up into a man, endured all the ugliness that humans have to face in an age as brutal as any ever has been just to be with you. Or to put a different emphasis on the word with, God who is so glorious and unapproachable that the angels cover their faces with their wings when they're in his presence, stepped off his throne, out of his heaven, onto this earth, into human skin, so that we could live in the same neighborhood, so that we could sit at the same table, so that we could rub elbows with the Almighty. That's different from any other story human beings have told. Because in all the other stories, Here's what they say. They say, here are the things you have to do to connect with God. Here are the marks you have to hit to connect with God. Here are the rules you have to obey. Here are the rituals you have to perform. And if you will obey these rules and perform these rituals and hit these marks, then you can connect with God. The story of Jesus is exactly the opposite. The Jesus story says, here is what God did to connect with you. He came down to you. We sang about this a moment ago. You didn't want heaven without us, and so you brought heaven to us. He came down to you because there was no way you could climb up to him. The impossible promise of Christmas is that God made the first move. He came to us. But there's an even more personal and painful aspect to this promise. I've had one of these moments, had a couple of them. I wonder if you have. You ever had a moment when you looked in the mirror, the the one in your bathroom, or the one that's glued to the windshield of your car? Or maybe it was just a metaphorical mirror in your head and you said, I hate myself. Maybe it's because you hadn't lived up to your own expectations. 
Maybe it's because you'd failed at something. Project at work, at school, or a relationship. Maybe it's because you had done something that really hurt somebody else or a lot of other people, hurt your family. Maybe it's because you didn't do something to help. Maybe it's because you had committed some really grievous sin and you, you, you tried to get over it, you tried to stop it, but you couldn't, you just kept going back to it again and again and again. Or maybe it's because so many people or the same people told you so many times that you were a disappointment that you started to believe it yourself. And you looked in the mirror and you said, I hate me. And in that moment, you felt that cosmic shame so overwhelmed with it that you didn't want to spend another minute with yourself. And then along comes Christmas. And you hear this story about a miraculously born child who's going to be called, his nickname is going to be God with us and you think that's impossible. Why would God want to be with me? I don't even want to be with me. But that's the promise. And that promise was kept. Now look, I, you may not want to be with God, but God came a long, long way to be with you. So let me ask one more question. If God went to that much trouble to be with you, to be with me, what does that say about God? And what does that say about you and me? Let's live with that question this week and answer it and see where it takes us. Let's stand, let's have a prayer, then we'll sing. God, thank you for being a God who keeps, uh, thank you for being a God who makes impossible promises and then keeps them. Thank you for science and for the incredible discoveries science and scientists have given us. And thank you for every now and then doing something so outside the possible that the smartest scientist could never explain it and all we can say is it's a miracle. Thank you for being a God who isn't bound by anything, even the rules you made. And God, we pray that you would help us to believe the impossible that no matter how evil or wicked or broken or worthless or shameful we are, you loved us enough. God, there's a person in this room right now who just doesn't believe it, but you convince them that you loved them enough to come in the person of Jesus Christ so that they, we, I, could identify with you. Thank you for being a God who loved impossible people enough to do the impossible. Help us believe it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. What hope we hold this solid night? A king is born in Bethlehem. Our journey long, we seek the light that leads to the
so much for being here today. Uh, great to see a really, really good crowd. You guys look pretty good, actually, this morning. Thanksgiving was good for you, I guess. And not very lively, either. That's great. A couple things to remind you of. Christmas play is coming up. The good, the bad, and the unimaginable. That's December 14th and 15th. That's a Friday and Saturday night. Tickets go on sale today, right outside these doors to my right, and you can pick those up. New member lunch, Sunday, December the 9th. A ladies' ministry, don't forget your jingle and mingle dinner on December the 6th. And we are continuing a hat and glove drive for children at Chaffee Elementary. So remember all those things this week. We really do appreciate you being here, and we will close in prayer. Our wonderful Father, we come before you uh, humbled that you see that we are worthy to have your Son sent to us, and that humbles us so much because we know we are not worthy, but we thank you. And as we have come through this season of thankfulness, we see around us greed. We see around us gluttony of all things. And we ask you our forgiveness, or your forgiveness. But we're thankful to be here. We're thankful for healing and uh, singing and, and praising you. And it lifts our hearts. And we thank you for that also. And we pray that as we leave this place, we will take a little bit more of you with us in our hearts. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.